Hi, I'm Mark Bernard, and I'm here to talk about defense in depth. I'm going to give you a quick 15 minute overview to improve your cybersecurity skills. And I'm going to do a comparison between government and commercial sector and the private sector so that you have a, a good understanding of how it works. My videos are designed to transfer knowledge and give you the skills that you need. In order to do that, I go through four steps. I go through the knowledge transfer so that you're aware of what the topic is that we're talking about. And then I help you to understand it. And then once you can understand it, you can apply it. These are immediate skills. These are the type of skills that you would get in a university uh, or, or college. And then analyzing and being able to look back at what you've applied and how you've built it and implemented it and be able to determine if there's any sort of problems with it. So if you do encounter a problem, you can fix it. Anytime that you introduce a new topic, uh, you'll hear this uh, word used a lot, this description, digital transformation. People do tend to go through a cycle of activity, including denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance before they move on and accept it. So be prepared for that. If you recognize the different stages, these are very well known and documented, they've been researched, um, then you can prepare communication strategies or perhaps workshops or some way to educate others so that they can uh, you know, buy into the process and support it as you move forward. Again, I'm going to be comparing what government and commercial sectors do uh, versus families so you have a good understanding. And by the way, razor wire won't stop cybercrime. So defense in depth uh, is designed specifically uh, to discourage or to uh, wear down any sort of a hacker or a threat agent who tries to penetrate uh, your network and steal your data. And of course, the best way to do that is have multiple layers. In this case, uh, this is an illustration of a type of defense in depth, but it's only got two layers. It's got a chain link fence on the outside and electrical wire on the inside. And this specifically has to do with uh, cyber, or uh, sorry, physical security. It's, it's like a compound. You can see there's cameras in the corner and some sensors to monitor the yard. So it's probably remotely monitored. But this only deals with physical security. In the cybersecurity world, physical security is not important, or at least not that important. Most frameworks, such as the ISO 27001, has at least nine layers, and those layers touch on business continuity, communications and operations, information systems acquisition and development, physical security, access control, incident handling, human resources, policy, architecture, and legal obligations, and governance, risk management, and quality management. Each of these layers have specific risks associated with them, and within the ISO 27001, there are also uh, compensating controls that have been designed to mitigate those risks. Again, building a defense in depth is all about building layers. It's like a hurdle race in, in the Olympics, as you can see, when people have to leap over uh, one hurdle after another, eventually they get tired and sometimes discouraged. Really good hacking teams might go all the way, but uh, the majority of them will stop and you can uh, prevent them from penetrating and getting into your data by building more layers. And that's what Defense In Depth is all about. It's also about people handing off the baton when you're in a marathon, uh, handing the security baton off to the next team within a larger organization such as government or enterprise where you have thousands of employees working together, sometimes thousands just working on security alone. So you have incident handlers, you have people doing access control and physical security, all of those nine layers that we mentioned before that are defined in the ISO 27001 represent different groups within the organization. So all of these teams have to work together in order to win the race. Let's look at government and commercial sector. Within the government or commercial sector, you're going to have a number of layers. So you can see the perforated line goes around a physical site. And uh, the segmentation is what we call it within the physical site. You can see where the data center uh, and uh, also the security event monitoring system are layered within the organization. So we have three layers there. Now, normally, the security rule is that you have two firewalls between you and the wild, wild internet. And, uh, and 
in this illustration, we don't actually show two firewalls. We have one firewall, as you can see, going immediately into the network. And then the data center is protected by an access control list from the internal network. In the internal network, you have privileged users who have been granted access. Uh, you have desktops, you have apps running. All of these are connected to the internet. And you may have uh, cloud services, which are sitting out away from the internet, but connected through the internet. So VPN tunnels and encryption are used in order to transfer data back and forth. This gives you uh, a low cost operational uh, infrastructure uh, that can be uh, allocated and it's elastic so it can be retracted when you don't need it and then it can be expanded quickly when you do need it. But uh, within that cloud, uh, they also have to have at least the same or equal security controls that you have within your organization. Now, in the private sector, we don't have these things. We'll talk about that in a minute. Again, the, in the cloud, you also connect to apps that your uh, customers may have on their smartphones. You may connect to partners who are providing services to you, or employees may be connecting to your office systems through the internet. Uh, and then, of course, there are hackers sitting out there uh, trying to penetrate that. Um, organizations that are well-defined have intelligence systems such as honeypots. And what they do is they propagate these uh, devices with a type of data that a hacker might look for when they come knocking on your business door. So if you're in the government, you may have some government type data on the honeypot and you may be monitoring that honeypot such as we're doing within the data center. You can see where the security and event management system is monitoring the inside of the network and the sensitive systems. Well, you may have a similar configuration on your honeypot and it may be sitting in something called a DMZ, which is a demilitarized zone that sits between uh, the first firewall and the second firewall in your infrastructure. Now, uh, within uh, a defense in depth, you have a demarcation line, you have the internet on the outside, and you have the hackers on the outside, and you have the employees on the inside. Within the government or commercial sector, you're going to have all of these layers behind the, the demarcation line on the internal network. So you're going to have governance, you're going to have a management team who makes decisions, nothing gets done or approved unless governance is followed. You also have risk management, which means that uh, management or subject matter experts or the uh, risk management team are evaluating uh, where the priority are, where the priorities are, pardon me, uh, within the infrastructure so that they can apply security as it's needed in the places where perhaps you have more sensitive data or perhaps there's more exposure. Then you have legal obligations and asset management. So you can't protect what you don't know about, so you have to do an inventory of your assets and know what those sensitive assets are. You also have to know what your legal obligations are. So you have compliance and regulatory requirements as well as contractual obligations to your customers and to partners if you're providing services to external uh, organizations. And then human resources is the third layer. And this is where you get to decide who it is that comes to work for you. Uh, you get to do some background checks to see if they have criminal records, or you get to do some checking to see if they have uh, financial problems and they might be vulnerable to bribery or blackmail. And then you have incident handling because if Anything goes wrong on the governance, legal, or human resource side, you need to deal with the, the, the incident immediately. You need to shut it down, close it, and take care of it. And then uh, you have access control. And access control actually, even though it's at layer five, it goes uh, both uh, forward and backward through all of the layers if it's done properly. However, uh, access control decisions aren't made until you hire the right people with human resources, determine what your obligations are legally, uh, also do some risk evaluations, and also uh, prepare an instant handling team. So that's why it's at layer five and not layer one. Physical security comes after that because uh, all of those previous layers have to be in place before you can actually implement physical security in a meaningful way. And then you have acquisition development and maintenance which is the ongoing sort of operational day-to-day -day stuff that happens within an organization. And you have telecommunications that's going on. And then of course, business continuity is your ninth layer. And that's uh, what happens when everything else goes sideways or you lose your data center and your data, you need to be able to do something about that and respond to that. So here's where you do that. Uh, you uh, wipe a server or you uh, wipe a desktop or a laptop 
uh, and then you reload it with the data that was already backed up. Now let's compare that to a family situation, for instance. So in the previous section, you had nine layers, but in a house, uh, you may not have that many layers. So let's talk about that. Um, so in the family situation, <coughs> remember we were talking about the infrastructure earlier, we were looking at this slide and saying, wow, look at all the layers and all the involvement here. It's very complex. This is a typical government uh, which is actually way more complex and some commercial enterprises also very very more complex than this but I wanted to give you sort of some contrast now uh, within a, a typical family you have your house which probably has a router on it very simple there's no DMZ no demilitarized zone there's no access control list there's no segmentation within the network normally uh, if you're you know, um, quite savvy at uh, technology and security, you may have layers within your infrastructure. And if you're concerned about the Internet of Things, uh, you probably should think about it carefully because the Internet of Things, of course, is, introduces exposures right into your front room and your bedrooms. So you have the router, it's connected to the Internet. And through the Internet, you get access to a number of different things. So you could be at the coffee shop, you could be accessing your smart devices at home through the router and through the Internet. So you want to make sure that there's encryption there. Not much security. You've got a couple routers, the internet, and hopefully you've put in some VPN tunnels. Also, there's the office. Now, chances are the office has a lot of security requirements. So if you're accessing for work, then uh, they may have imposed a number of layers on their side, but they're probably not going to impose anything in your house. Uh, so that's all up to you. And then you have your smartphone, probably the biggest exposure, right? Uh, because it goes inside the house, outside. It has all these apps very little security on apps um, but they collect a lot of data so you can imagine uh, the problem that could create and then uh, you may have a, a car or an automobile that also has like bluetooth in it for instance to use for your smartphone it may be collecting data as well it has a black box in it it records your mileage how fast you're driving all that other sort of stuff it may be even more smart than that some uh, more modern devices you can actually install apps on them and uh, you can store data in them and then of course you have cloud computing now cloud computing is very popular not just for governments and commercial enterprises but it's also very popular uh, for apps so a lot of phones a lot of smartphones samsung apple um, google they all have clouds behind them so that when you you know lose your device or smash it or something you just go to the store buy a new one and press a few buttons and it downloads whatever data and stuff because it comes from the cloud but that cloud also introduces exposures. Now, again, similar to the office, the cloud is probably going to have a lot more layers of security and depends in depth. Now, how does it look from the demarcation side? Well, you saw uh, before we had nine layers up here and uh, very well organized and designed. But down here, for the typical citizen, this is probably what you're going to see. Uh, so they probably don't have any governance, really, per se. Um, if you want to buy something, you buy something, you plug it in the, in your uh, office, and that's it, or in your home, rather. Um, you may not actually understand your legal obligations. You may have heard of things like the GDPR, uh, General Data Protection Act, but you may not fully understand it or how it applies to you, so you may not be doing anything with that. You may have other privacy legislations or regulations that you're not following. Uh, you probably don't have any human resources. Uh, I doubted it that you're hiring people for your home, uh, but you may have people coming in. That's possible. So you want to make sure they're doing background checks on those people and checking to see if they have criminal behavior and they're bonded, etc., so forth, right? And have insurance, of course. And then uh, you may not have any instant handling practice. So perhaps if you drop a phone and you break it, you just go to buy a new one, download from the uh, cloud, and you don't worry about it. So there's no uh, analysis to determine what the scope of the damage is or what data was affected or what the possible exposures were none of that goes on in a typical house but it goes on within the commercial and government sector now you probably have access control uh, almost everybody has at least a password or something to protect their banking account or any other type of e-commerce uh, sites you may also have uh, two pieces of uh, information that you have to validate in order to get access to uh, more sensitive websites such as banking or um, maybe medical records or uh, any sort of e-commerce with 
credit card numbers in it. Usually you have dual authentication is what they call it. Um, now physical security, obviously you have your house, you may have cameras on your house, you may have security monitoring on your house. It's probable, okay? Most houses I think these days have that sort of surveillance or that sort of capability, uh, but there's probably uh, thousands or millions more that don't, right? Um, acquisition and development and maintenance, probably you don't go through the process of evaluating software to determine if it's gonna fit within your current stack of technology, which we'll be talking about in another presentation. But uh, you do go through a process of uh, going down to Best Buy or wherever it is, the source, to evaluate software. You may have done some research online. You may order it online, have Amazon, or uh, deliver it right to your door, right? But it's probably not as heavy duty as you would see in a commercial organization or as much due diligence done or thoroughness uh, with the number of checks and balances before it actually gets deployed within your infrastructure. Telecommunications, you obviously must have telecommunications in order to have access to the internet or your phones. There's some sort of telecommunications going on, but you probably don't have business continuity. Maybe you have backed up your data, stored it in a safety deposit box at the bank, which would be really smart, um, especially your sensitive data, things that uh, you can't replace or it takes a long time uh, to get it replaced, things that people could use against you, uh, types of data, uh, things that you need to protect, right? Uh, if you have it on your server at home, it should be encrypted. You should be using some sort of encryption technology in order to protect that information. So you can see, um, we went from having nine layers within a typical government or uh, commercial sector organization to having only like four layers uh, within a typical home. And that's even pushing it a little bit, as you know. Now, I want you to understand that uh, you may have antivirus installed on your computer. And a lot of companies are trying to tell you that this is the best thing that you can do in order to protect yourself from cyber threats. Well, they're not too far off. I mean, uh, it will address at least 60% of the known threats. And some of those tools now have uh, behavioral analytics so that they can actually check for different patterns. So if something new comes along and it's similar to a, uh, another pattern of a different piece of what they call malware or malicious software, um, it might be able to detect it and stop it or evaluate it, right? That is possible, okay? But generally, um, as a former Red Team member uh, with IBM, I can tell you that at least 40% of the uh, impact or the exp uh, exposure uh, is available for hackers. There's hackers that go within networks, whether it's government or commercial sector, that are completely undetected. And they may actually be uh, there for some time. Uh, there's a, a new metric actually that's being used to evaluate uh, the time that a hacker spends within a network. It's called dwell time. And it's part of the uh, calculation when you're considering risk. Now, 40% of those uh, known risks, uh, you have to take special care uh, to address them. And it's probably not gonna happen again within the typical household. But within a government or commercial sector, uh, industry, uh, you're probably going to see some of this going on. So they're probably looking at monitoring for anomalies. So they have a baseline within their infrastructure and they're looking at any sort of changes or any little blips on the map. And then they're going uh, after it doing some threat hunting. Now threat hunting is when you not only just look externally at the people that are trying to attack you, such as using the honeypot to determine who it is trying to attack you, but you might also look internally at the network and the infrastructure to determine if there are any exposures within the uh, infrastructure and, and threats. There's also something called heuristic analysis and this is where you again you, you start looking at the baseline. Now monitoring for anomalies tends to look at more behavioral kind of analytics but heuristic analysis looks at the stability of the network and any sort of fluctuations so you have to have special tools to be able to monitor the throughput and the capacity of your network in order to determine if there's any kind of exposure or problem happening there. And then there's threat intelligence uh, the integration and the orchestration, uh, which is like automation within these uh, different security tools, uh, sometimes referred to as the security fabric uh, that is layered over top of uh, an organization, whether it's in the commercial sector or government. Chances are, again, that you don't have this. Uh, these four things are probably not included within a typical antivirus system or a firewall system, um, although they will tell you that they will stop everything 
there's probably 40% of the things that they can stop that they're not telling you about or discussing. <clears throat> now there's a vulnerability management process, which is probably the quickest bang for your buck. There's a number of things that you can do within vulnerability management that will help reduce your exposure. Those things include uh, monitoring the manufacturers of your software and your hardware for any vulnerabilities or patch releases and doing updates as required. Sometimes the updates do break things, but not always. Uh, most of the time they actually do fix things, so it's good to update your equipment, whether it's software or hardware. Also, prioritizing the remediation of risk management, uh, a, a risk rating system to rank the risks in order to deal with those. Now, again, you may not do that within the typical household, but uh, with, certainly within a commercial sector or government sector, you should be doing this. Creating a registry of assets that require remediation, uh, knowing uh, which assets need to be protected the most by doing your risk analysis against those assets. Testing patches before you deploy them. And this gets back to my earlier comment about sometimes you deploy a patch to certain software vendors uh, that I've worked with who don't actually tell you what their patches are changing. And then you have to spend time with a business analyst or a security uh, penetration tester in order to determine what is breaking or what is changing in order to determine if there's any sort of exposure to you. There's also the distribution of patch installation, making sure that it's done properly and deployed properly and, and tested. And of course, within a large organization, uh, such as an enterprise that spans the globe, uh, like a data center, often data centers are in at least five or six different continents uh, around the globe in order to reduce uh, their exposure to being out and to provide continuous service to all their customers. So making sure those patches are fixed and deployed properly. Also, uh, using any sort of automatic uh, application, uh, applications that can update things or monitor activities of any of your software or infrastructure to determine if there is a gap and then warn you about that so that you can get it fixed. There are some tools in the commercial sector that we use. There's some uh, regulatory requirements such as PCI, DSS that's used for anybody who handles Visa or MasterCards and they have specific requirements uh, that kind of follow the same sort of pattern as I'm laying out here, where you have planned tests every 30 days, and then you have quarterly tests that you have to conduct, and it falls into this little grid that you can see that's uh, on the slide here. And then there's uh, verifying and validating. So once you've implemented a patch to fix something, you should have some sort of independent review of that to make sure that it was done properly. If you allow the same people to validate it that implemented it, chances are there's going to be a hit and miss kind of situation going on. Uh, some of the organizations I work for, uh, we actually have uh, annual or semi-annual uh, penetration testing, which is a type of security testing where you see if you can hack into the system and, you know, expose it to anything. So uh, that's a good exercise to go through. And then finally, training local administrators to be able to do all of this vulnerability management stuff. Now, my company, uh, Secure Knowledge Management uh, Incorporated, uh, we provide help for organizations. Uh, also, we can provide help for individuals. So uh, we have uh, four main service lines. Uh, we learn and, uh, learn and certify is about training people and providing them with the skills such as I'm sharing here with you. Uh, there's also the do-it-yourself kind of approach, which are for people who already have a lot of the knowledge, such as we talked about, um, and all they need are people to provide like procedures or policies or standards or maybe some awareness training, things like that, so we can help them with that and support them. Uh, then there's also seek expertise. So if you're really not sure what you're doing, you have a small mom and pop organization, you don't have the money or the budget to hire a full-time security person, you want to hire someone or put them on retainer, uh, whether it's a chief information security officer or an IT auditor or a security manager or maybe it's a security analyst, uh, we can provide all those services for you um, based on a retainer over a period of time. <clears throat> and then there's outsourcing. Now outsourcing is really uh, when you don't have the money to do things like security monitoring, for instance, like we could uh, implement a security monitoring. We could put what we call test access points within your network. We could set up intrusion or host prevention systems to detect any sort of anomalies or any threats to your organization. And then we could respond to those and we could carry out the incident handling procedure on your behalf. Uh, or you, maybe you have a project 
maybe you're uh, thinking of taking your organization in and going for your initial public offering, the IPO, but you need to do some due diligence. You need to have somebody provide security assurance. So that's something else that my organization can do. We can do it on an annual basis or on an ad hoc basis. Also, if you're a new startup organization and you have people coming to you uh, who you're entertaining as investors, they're going to want to do some due diligence. So you need somebody with that experience who can help you accomplish that. And my organization can do that. We have the experience. We've been there and done that before. Now, I want to thank you for your time. I know I ran over uh, the 50-minute mark. We're at the 25-minute mark now. So I do appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, drop me an email. Give me a call. I'd be uh, happy to help you. Have yourself a great day, and thank you.